Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to speak at the Indian Heart Rhythm Society meeting this year. Of course, I wish I could be there in person, uh, but nonetheless, it's indeed a privilege and an honor. I'm going to speak about ECGs and atrial fibrillation detection by watches, opportunities and challenges. And my name is Mintu Tarakia, and I am a uh, electrophysiologist at Stanford and run our Center for Digital Health. Here is the timeline of pulse rhythm monitoring devices over the years. You can see that this really starts from the first pacemaker back with digital signal processing in 1993, going all the way through a variety of devices until the present day, including smartwatches, wearable fitness trackers, ECG watches, and smartphone connected ECG devices, such as the Alive Core device. What we know in the United States and in much of the world, although this data may not be representative of some parts of Asia or India, is that wearable ownership and digital health tracking continue to go up. So the important thing here is that wearable ownership has gone up during the pandemic years as people have been trying to engage in more health uh, management at home and from a distance due to the pandemic. And the use of digital health tools for health tracking has also increased. What we've also noticed is that people are now using these tools, not simply for wellness or fitness or sleep, but to actually manage a diagnosed condition as you see here. So again, this has some relevance and importance to atrial fibrillation and the field of cardiology as we shift now for home-based disease management. There's a lot of different ways you can assess atrial fibrillation burden, for example, and they're listed here in a two by two table with continuous implantable devices. It's sort of your gold standard and what we're used to in electrophysiology with pacemakers, ICDs and insertable cardiac monitors. But then you can you have intermittent ECG detection with smartphone and smartwatch ECGs and continuous and semi-continuous AFib and pulse detection using photoplethysmography on a watch. So uh, I'll go through the landscape of most of these devices, starting with kind of what we know, which are the implantables. So I won't speak much today about pacemakers and ICDs, but really look at insertable cardiac monitors. Here, uh, what is not really well appreciated is that the positive predictive value of these early generation devices was actually not very good. You can see them listed here. The first generation was as low as 26%. Now over time, this got better as the algorithms got better and we learned to not look for short episodes which have low specificity. The specificity is significantly higher for these longer episodes such as one hour and you can program ICMs to do this. Now, if you go into the intermittent area since uh, you get into smartphone ECGs and smartwatch ECGs, Continuous ECG recording on a smartwatch is not possible for a variety of technical reasons, including battery drain and noise. And so the strategy really is an intermittent one. And obviously we know what a 12 lead ECG is. On a smartwatch, typically you're doing a lead one ECG using your left arm and your right arm. On a watch, for example, there is an electrode on the, um, on the back of the face of the watch. And when you touch the crown of the watch with your right hand or the opposite hand, you get the same thing, a left arm, right arm ECG. Now, there are multi-lead devices that are smartphone connected, such as this Alive Core six lead device. And what this does is has an electrode on the backside, which is touching the leg. So you get a two arm and one leg configuration, which gives you your precordial and your derived leads as you see on the right. So here's a case that I want to talk about in terms of the limitations of smartwatches. This is just a 76 year old man who had an irregular pulse, took an ECG on his Apple watch and came with this. Uh, the watch said he had atrial fibrillation. Um, and what would you say? Well, you might say on quick look, this looks irregular and there's no organized P wave activity. And this is a fib. But if you take a closer look at this ECG, what you actually see is that there is some organized P wave activity flanking the QRSs. And if you were to take calipers and march that through, it actually marches. You actually see one in the middle of that second RR complex uh, where there's a P wave. And the reason you don't see it in every beat is because of a dynamic filtering algorithm that some consumer devices use. And so it attenuates through variable pass filtering, the ability to see this depending on where you are in the QRS complex. This was a, a mitral annular flutter in a person who had two prior AFib ablations. And so this really wasn't atrial fibrillation. Uh, 
Maybe for some physicians, it doesn't make a difference, but obviously very important in EP. And so I wanted to caution you on the limitations of interpretability with non-medical grade ECGs. Can you actually met, have patients measure their ECGs uh, periodically to approximate AFib burden? And the answer is yes. So this is looking at simulated data from the MSTOPS trial, which used ZEO patches, which is an ambulatory ECG patch. And the simulated detection uh, rates they got was around 53 to 76%. And so the more you measure, as you see on the right, uh, over a longer period of intermittent screening, the more AFib you find. And so if you simply were to do a twice daily ECG over a two week period, rather than continuous patch or Holter monitoring, you would miss people with low burden AFib, but you would catch people with burden greater than 5%. And that may be more clinically actionable anyway. So this again is not a strategy in practice, but one that could be very, very viable for ongoing AFib burden surveillance in patients. Let's talk about smartphone apps and pulse tech devices as well. So most cell phones, as you know, from your own experience has the camera and the flashlight right next to each other. What this allows you to do is transilluminate your finger um, and place it over the camera sensor. So you can go ahead and uh, do that and see what is happening um, with the pulse, no differently than photoplethysmography. So um, that ends up being an important thing that you can do to assess whether um, you have atrial fibrillation, not just the heart rate alone, but you can also use that to analyze irregularity. It turns out that this approach in a pooled analysis from our work has high sensitivity and specificity, and the negative predictive value was pretty good. Generally, this was in a screening population without AFib, but the positive predictive value is low for that reason because the background prevalence is low. So again, this is not a, a strategy that's widely adopted, but it has been used in a few places. This is a com uh, from a company called FibroCheck, which has F um, approval in Europe to actually use uh, transillumination from the smartphone to look for AFib. It actually can give you a report of this variability to approximate AFib burden. And the advantage are, is are that everyone has a smartphone and most of these sensors are pretty comparable in what they do. Now, what about smartwatches with irregular pulse detection algorithms or overall pulse tracking? And so we know that you have a light on the back of a watch that can do this with irregularity. And this is a study that we ran out of Stanford that I led with Marco Perez called the Apple Heart Study. Uh, we conducted this um, device validation trial and had about 400,000 patients. And what this algorithm that was developed by Apple does is it looks in the background for an irregular pulse based on parameters of irregularity. Those short pulse sequences are called tachygrams. And one example is shown there of just a pulse contour tracing. And if it meets a regularity threshold, what the algorithm will then do is increase its monitoring, which is opportunistic to get you this. So uh, this is a, a way of surveying for a fib. Now, in order to maximize specificity, albeit at the cost of, sens of sensitivity, it doesn't give confirmation until it sees that you have five out of six consecutive irregular tachygrams over a 48 hour period. So again, what this is going to give you is something that is more specific and more suited for detecting slightly longer AF burdens. Now the Apple study was not the only one that had done this. This is a comparison of many of the recent studies that have been placed um, and to compare them. The best direct comparison is between the Apple study and the Fitbit study. So the Fitbit heart study was recently announced at the American Heart Association as well. And they were actually nearly identical in design and rolled a similar number of patients in the 400,000s. And you can see that the demographics for the most part are very similar. The positive predictive value for the Apple Watch was 84%, meaning that 84% of the time simultaneously there was atrial fibrillation, which again is actually on par with insertable cardiac monitors. The Fitbit positive predictive value was higher, which likely represents greater algorithm specificity. Um, and so again, this is important. There's a lot here. Um, the engagement in the trials is something 
from a trial, trialist standpoint is much to be uh, improved upon, but the diagnostic yield and the positive predictive values were very similar. So again, this tells you uh, that this works and it's not just one set of algorithms, but a number. The Huawei heart study was done in China, had a very similar design and also is a highly specific algorithm, I think. Um, so you had a high positive predictive value. Now, the other thing that is being done more and more in practice, at least here and in places where um, smart watch penetration is high, is that you can assess heart rate control and atrial fibrillation with reasonable accuracy by just looking at the patient's own heart rate data and seeing what they have. And so again, this can be very simple ways to assess AFib burden that obviously doesn't need an ECG or somebody to write this down in a book. This is very easy and useful for titrating rate control in patients with um, chronic or permanent atrial fibrillation. One of the biggest challenges though, is how to manage this data and what to do with it. And I love this cartoon, which is uh, many years old now, which says you can't list your iPhone as your primary care physician. And so if you look at remote monitoring options, there's several that we think of in the implantable space. Um, now that medical records are largely um, e electronic, there are conduits that can grab this remote monitoring data from the electronic health record there are middleware companies that provide software as a service to do all the background surveillance. And in the US, you can pay third party companies to do all of this management. This is quite important in the US because we have a very good reimbursement for uh, remote monitoring. And this is a pretty much a necessary uh, offering that an arrhythmia practice and a general cardiology practice has to offer. If you think of the data you get now with wearables and not implantables, you are looking at three data types. You're looking at continuous streams of data, both based on what I showed you. You're looking at episodic data, data capture, which is the sort of getting an ad hoc ECG and alerts and notifications, which is a whole other area where your watch can be programmed to tell you or tell the user or patient if the heart rate is high, if the heart rate is low, or if AFib may have been suspected. And you can see some of these sample alert screenshots on the right. Now, there is also wearable remote monitoring options that have been commercialized in the US. Self-management is based on direct-to-consumer subscriptions. That's not really used in healthcare. It's more of a wellness product. We also have remote patient monitoring, again, as software as a service. And the worst, of course, is the patient just keeps emailing you, and that's the one thing you would want to avoid. It's important to understand that not all of these devices are approved for AFib management. And so remember that you can't really use the PPG irregular pulse detection algorithm for AFib surveillance in a diagnosed patient. It's not designed for that, it's not approved for that, and it's not sensitive enough to do that until we have more studies. And so in the foreseeable future, we have to stick with the pulse rate. So looking at, again, the information, I'll go through some examples. This is a 67-year-old man with symptomatic paroxysmal AFib who had pulmonary vein isolation. He's doing fine after ablation with no symptoms. He had a two week ambulatory ECG monitor and it showed normal sinus rhythm. What might you do for monitoring? You can really use any of these except again, the PPG detection. The easiest is a daily ECG check or simply looking at heart rate to assess for possible um, AFib or irregularity that can then be prompted with a follow-up home-based ECG. So very straightforward there. What about a 50-year-old woman who has cardiomyopathy due to prolonged rapid atrial fibrillation? So she's non-ischemic uh, tachycardia or AFib-associated cardiomyopathy. Uh, when her sinus rhythm was restored, her EF normalized, what might you do here? So this is a situation where the patient has less awareness of being in AFib and maybe going fast. Soups. So the same applies where you can survey heart rates um, because usually these are tachycardia mediated, not simply AFib in the absence of uh, significant tachycardia or a daily ECG would be adequate as well. But these are useful strategies. An insertable monitor may be appropriate if it can be monitored well and if the patient doesn't have uh, the ability or access to these uh, to use or the access to these technologies. And finally, we may get to a point where we don't use watches at all. Today, we talk about them. Tomorrow, it may be something new. And this is an idea that's been shown to work, which is to use um, a video camera to assess facial plethysmography. So they're sensitive enough 
You don't need a special camera, you just need software to um, detect changes in blood flow, which can detect not only heart rate, but irregularity that may indicate AFib, just like putting your finger on a smartphone, except now you don't have to put your finger on anything. This could be done in a clinic. Obviously, there are ethical concerns about this, and, and I've published on this, but this was a really nice study from Bed Freeman and Dr. Young um, that looked in Hong Kong to evaluate this, and it works. And we may see more of this coming into play. And so who knows if we're moving to kind of the new smart home here, but I do think that in many parts of the world where this is fast growing, remote patient monitoring in some ways might be the next home alarm system. So I'll close to say that wearables are not directly designed to measure AFib burden yet. These are some approximation strategies that I showed you. Watch irregular rhythm notification. The PPG-based algorithm is not approved for AFib and not designed for assessing burden. You really have to assess burden and anchor it to the ECG. Remote monitoring uh, or RPM is here to stay and will, I think, continue to grow worldwide. And so now what we need to do is create better disease management solutions that are software enabled. But we have some strong forces to shift us to automated or self-management. Um, but the important thing is we've really come a long way. And I think it's remarkable to think about where we are going, uh, considering these were the first ECG watches that were uh, commercialized in the mid 1990s. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and I look forward to the discussion. Good evening. Uh, thank you, IHRS, for giving me this opportunity. And today I'm going to discuss about post cardiac surgery atrial fibrillation is consideration in hospital and later. Uh, I have nothing to disclose. I, we all know that atrial fibrillation after cardiac surgery is the most common post operative complications, and it is up to 25% in CABG and Valve surgery has a higher chance. If you mix combined CABG and valve surgery, up to 50% patient will experience some form of atrial fibrillation. And the incidence of atrial fibrillation after cardiac surgery remain unchanged from a very long time, despite this lot of improvement in cardiac surgical procedures. It is not only the problem of uh, cardiac surgery, but uh, thoracic surgery, the incidence is up to 30%. Non-cardiac surgery also has 1% to 15%. While atrial fibrillation after cardiac surgery has been considered as a transient phenomena, but it is associated with increased mortality and morbidity, increased stroke, upper respiratory tract infection, GI dysfunction, renal dysfunction, short and long-term mortality. Now, it is correlated with a longer hospital stay and more cost to the patient. There's a recent uh, article published in circulation, post-operative atrial fibrillation and long-term risk of stroke after isolated CABG, and they evaluated about 3,000 patients, about uh, 24 patients developed AF and 76% uh, uh, do not have an active fibrillation, and then found that after 10 years, the cumulative incident of CBA was 6.3% uh, in patients who develop AF versus uh, those who do, do not have post-op AF. And they concluded that paroxysmal post-op active fibrillation is an independent predictor of CBA at 10 years. It is unlikely that a single unifying mechanism is behind the development of atrial fibrillation in post-op period. It is usually a combination of a trigger and a substrate. The most common trigger impulse is from the junction of left atrium and pulmonary vein. A lot of patient factors, uh, cardiac surgical factors, and endogenous and exogenous post-operative factors are responsible for uh, development of atrial fibrillation. Now, usually these patients has a predisposition atrial dilatation, and there may be in perioperative period, there may be a direct surgical trauma. It has been observed that cardiopulmonary bypass, the atria remain active, electrical active, despite a sufficient cardioplasia, which may contribute to atrial arrhythmia, and there's a lot of electrolyte imbalance and fluid shift occurs. There are a lot of proarrhythmic factors which contribute like endogenous catecholamine release, inflammatory nauseatory mediated secondary to surgical stress, and systemic response to bypass, use of a lot of catecholamines, and a lot of intra-volume vascular shift. 
There's two important peaking. First phase encompasses the first 18 hours and the greater risk at zero hour and second at 24 to 48 hours. And there's a lot of risk factors for atrial fibrillation during cardiac surgery. And they are there is, there's a prior history of atrial fibrillation, obesity, COPD, renal dysfunction, vulvar disease, male general, you have withdrawn the beta blocker and a lot of eco parameter like LV dysfunction, hypertrophy, increased atrial volume. And the most consistent risk factor is increasing age. There's a very beautiful systemic review in which is published in Nature uh, Cardiology, which uh, given a very exhaustive mechanism of atrial fibrillation during preoperative, perioperative, and postoperative period of cardiac surgery. Now, what are the preventive strategies uh, uh, which is being advocated? And we all know this list of preventive strategies which has been advocated both pharmacological and non-pharmacological. Let us go one by one. The electrolyte management is very important, especially hypomagnesemia, because hypomagnesemia predisposes for atrial fibrillation. And it diminishes response to potassium supplement and beta blocker also. There is a beautiful meta-analysis, which is uh, published in 2013, which included several studies, uh, which has given intraoperative intramarous magnesium and found a significant reduction in post-operative atrial fibrillation in magnesium arm. Potassium, yes, potassium is also frequently depleted among cardiac surgical patients. It is known to uh, precipitate uh, the atrial fibrillation and every cardiac surgeon wants that his target potassium label should be between 4.5 to 5.5 during or post-op surgery. But there's no well-developed randomized trial which suggests how tight potassium control should be done in these patients for prevention of atrial fibrillation. However, there's a recent trial, tight potassium trial is going on which may give they have uh, randomized to relax to more than 3.6, a very tight control to more than 4.5, and it will give them the uh, correct answer. Amadron, yes, the systemic review, including about more than 30 studies, shows that uh, giving pre-operative prophylactic amadron significantly decreases the development of atrial fibrillation uh, in post-op cardiac patients, and it is class 2 a indication at present. Beta blocker, yes, beta blocker is class one indication and a lot of data of beta blocker which shows that pre-operative beta blocker significantly decreases the occurrence of new onset atrial fibrillation in post-op period. Sotolol, yes, the review of the literature says that Sotolol is significantly decrease the atrial fibrillation in the, if it is given as a prophylaxis in pre-op. And, but still it is to be because it has a lot of side effect. Um, uh, so it has to be given cautiously in these patients. The Sotolol has advantage over and above beta blocker. So the trials comparing Sotolol to beta blocker indicates that Sotolol has advantage over and above the beta blocker. Renalazine, the two good uh, randomized meta, sorry, the, the, the two good meta analysis, which in, we practically included the same studies as six, so that renalazine significantly decrease the occurrence of atrial fibrillation if given preoperatively. Calcium channel blocker, it is only for a rate control when beta blocker are contraindicated, but it should not be given as a prophylaxis. No guideline recommend it. Uh, there's a lot of anti-inflammatory agents like corticosteroids, and uh, the role of corticosteroids in uh, good randomized trial has suggested that it decreases the chances of atrial fibrillation, so it is two B indications. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs should not be given. There's lack of evidence. Colchicine, as the recent meta-analysis which is recently published shows that colchicin significantly decreased the new onset atrial fibrillation when compared to placebo and it's still class 2B indication. Statins, yes, statins is still controversial. One meta-analysis, uh, which is an older meta-analysis, which shows that statin decreases the post-operative atri atrial fibrillation if given prior to the surgery. However, a very large randomized study published, including 5,000 patients, says that statin is not protective against post-operative atrial fibrillation, rather giving uh, statin prior to surgery has increased risk of acute kidney injury. So the role of statin is controversial for prevention of atrial fibrillation. Polyunsaturated fatty acid, two important meta-analysis suggest that it significantly decreases the atrial fibrillation uh, post-operatively. Levosimendon, a controversial one meta-analysis say that it decreases, others say it is increases, and one meta-analysis meta is neutral, so it is not recommended. Yes, and a style system is a very promising drug and there's three meta-analysis which has come recently and which all shows consistently that it decreases the chances of atrial fibrillation. Vitamin C and combined antioxidant has conflicting results. Uh, 
नॉन फार्मोकोलॉजिकल मैनेजमेंट लाइक एक्ट्रियल पेसिंग एक्ट्रियल पेसिंग यूज ऑफ प्रोफाइलेक्टिक ओवर ड्राइव एक्ट्रियल पेसिंग हैज शोन टू डिक्रीज द एक्ट्रियल फेबुलेशन इन ऑल दी स्टडीज सो एट प्रेजेंट it is class 2b recommendation for a high risk patients the posterior pericardectomy approach has shown consistently to decrease the atrial fibrillation uh, both meta analysis which is published in 2013 and a recent meta analysis however the uh, the the, uh, the other side effect of posterior pericardectomy need to be considered before seeing this approach there is uh, there is other uh, things uh, which are being which are being used for this like epicardial fat pad manipulation anterior fat pad preservation fat pad botulinum toxin injection concomitant surgical ablation off pump versus on pump bypass there's no convincing evidence that off pump bypass decreases the atrial fibrillation at present still how if you have given a prophylactic antiarrhythmic drugs uh, in these patients till how long you should continue and the data suggests till one month you should continue these medications the treatment strategies uh, the available data suggests that most cases of atrial fibrillation return to sinus within at the end of 24 hours however people still believe that uh, uh, if patient is not hemodynamically unstable rate control is a good approach in this situation and the rate control strategies can be done by beta blocker or ccb amadron and digoxin is also being advocated for control of the rate for rhythm control the ec and aha guidelines state that it's reasonable to restore sinus rhythm pharmacologically with ibutalite or direct current cardioversion in patient who develop af or to administer antiarrhythmic medication in an attempt to maintain sinus rhythm in recurrent or refractory atrial fibrillation but however the uh, and in this patient who in which you want to give anticoagulation and the risk of bleeding is very high i think rhythm control strategy should be considered and how it should be done electric cardioversion and the pharmacological cardioversion two drugs are being advocated amadron and uh, ibutalite um, you can also give sotalol varna calent is not available in india so amadron and ibutalite is a drug of choice in this situation anticoagulation if af lasts more than 48 hours i think anticoagulation should be strongly considered and uh, it has been shown that in these patients if you continue anticoagulation for short period of time it prevents it it reduces the long term mortality and this is a beautiful diagram which has shown that predisposing factor post operative triggers leading to atrial fibrillation with lot of complications so uh, this is this is a flow chart uh, how to approach these patients a patient develop post operative atrial fibrillation i think electrolyte Uh, withdrawing the inotrop proper hydration proper oxygenation pain control is the most important if patient uh, is stable if patient is hemodynamically not stable then i think you will try to cardio over this patient as soon as possible if they are hemodynamically stable see the ejection fraction if they have lv dysfunction i think amadron and beta blocker should be considered in those situation calcium channel blocker should not be considered and if af resolve automatically i think you continue this therapy for a 6 6 to 8 weeks and if there is an atrial fibrillation i think uh, the strategy to con convert uh, need to be uh, discussed uh this is again a beautiful diagram again sh sh shows that only um, uh, anticoagulants to be given if af lasts more than 48 hours and the second important thing observe for 24 hours in hemodynamically stable patient if rate is control observe for 24 hours don't try to uh, control the rhythm this is an cardiovascular society and sociology guidelines which again say that a high risk pre operative which by age history of af renal failure mitral valve surgery heart failure copd they give that prophylactic beta blocker to be given to all and if you see the high risk i think you add to amadron in those situation and these are the european journal of cardiothoracic guideline class 1 indication is only beta blocker and if patient is hemodynamically unstable you have to maintain the rhythm in this patient so atrial fibrillation uh, after cardiac surgery is the most uh, common adverse event after cardiac surgery it is associated with significant morbidity and uh, th there are few studies which have shown that it it has an adverse effect on mortality also Uh, it is unlikely that a single uniform mechanism is responsible for development of atrial fibrillation not a multiple mechanism involves in this situation it remain unclear whether prophylactic intervention like uh, amadron like um, uh, sotalol or atrial pacing uh, to be given to only high risk patients or to all patients however uh, 
still we recommend that beta blocker to be given to all patients, whether they belong to high risk or low risk. Some intervention, which is useful in primary AF setting, has a different risk benefit ratio when they are considering in post operative period, for example, anticognition. So, uh, at present, every society says that defer anticognition to 48 hours. It is still remain uncertain whether the relation between atrial fibrillation and poorer outcome is causative. Well designed future studies in the field should aspire to clarify the effect of their short term intervention on long term outcome measure, which is still not available. Uh, we need to develop a good validated risk stratification model, which will help to appropriately target protocol for preventive strategies in atrial fibrillation, especially after cardiac surgery, and which minimize some of the non-trivial risk of either atrial fibrillation itself or routine use of preventive measures. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Okay. So I, can I continue? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sir. Okay, thank you very much. So we're going to shift gears from post-operative atrial fibrillation to use of no action atrial fibrillation, particularly of chronic kidney disease. And that's a very, very difficult issue to discuss because uh, we don't have much randomized control data on patients with CKD. Uh, we know that patients with CKD are actually a very high risk group of individuals to develop uh, both as well as stroke and systemic uh, embolism. Basically, CKD has a bidirectional relationship with atrial fibrillation. Not only is the prevalence of atrial fibrillation extremely high in uh, patients with CKD, uh, you can see that the relative risk of stroke is also significantly higher as compared to the normal population. And as the severity of chronic kidney disease becomes worse, the incidence of atrial fibrillation plus the relative risk of score, uh, the risk of stroke increase exponentially. So not only that, there is an increase in the prevalence of atrial fibrillation and increase in the stroke rate. The worst problem in patients with renal disease is that they have an increased risk of bleeding. And in fact, in patients on warfarin, there is actually a tenfold increased risk compared to the general population when both these uh, groups of patients are treated with warfarin. Evidence for successful antithrombotic therapy in patients with, it, uh, with CKD decreases significantly as the severity of the chronic kidney disease increases. And whereas we have a large number of randomized clinical studies in patients who have GFR more than 30 ml per minute, where DOACs were found non-inferior or better than vitamin K antagonists. Unfortunately, in situations where CKD grade four or five, we have only observational data in which there are contradictory results regarding benefits of oral anticoagulating agents. We have some randomized control trials which are ongoing, but the results are weighted. There are concerns of drug accumulation because of metabolism of uh, uh, many of these drugs being dependent upon renal clearance and a very serious consideration of rapid worsening of renal function in presence of VKA because of calciphylaxis and other uh, problems that are associated with this. Now, this slide shows the bleeding rates on oral anticoagulation in patients with atrial fibrillation, and all patients with AF included in this Spanish registry divided by those with EGFR more than 130 versus those less than 30 and see that just three months incidence of major bleeding is three times higher in those with GFR of less than 30. Now in patients with end-stage renal disease with atrial fibrillation, the, as it is, the incidence of bleeding is high, but incidence is much higher if patients are on antiplatelet agents and much worse if they are on oral anticoagulation. This is not surprising because uh, atrial fibrillation and CKD CKD patients have both factors that predispose to bleeding as well as procoagulant factors. And this is primarily because of dysfunctional platelets, presence of uremic toxins, anemia, and a host of other factors that predispose to bleeding in association with many procoagulant factors, such as atherosclerosis and diffuse endothelial damage, dysfunctional activated protein C metabolism, and a number of other factors that are listed on the slide. 
if you look at the risk system and major available random in patients who with EGFR of less than 50 ml per minute, we'll notice that in none of these studies, EGFR of less than 30 were actually included. Approximately one fifth of the patients in all the randomized trials had chronic, chronic kidney disease. And whereas the stroke and systemic embolism, the, the drugs were non-inferior to warfarin. Actually, some of them were superior to warfarin. Uh, in terms of major bleeding, uh, Epixaban has shown less bleeding and so has the Dacaban as compared to the other two namely Devigatran and Rivaroxaban. And overall, if you see the total meta-analysis, there is a reduction in risk of bleeding as compared to warfarin, whereas there is also overall in the meta-analysis, there is a reduction in incidence of stroke and systemic embolism. Now, here is another uh, systemic review and regression analysis uh, where that pairs no ACK versus the other. The previous one compared no ax with warfarin. And in this, uh, a number of studies have been included, including the usual uh, four randomized control trials and then J-Rocket, et cetera, et cetera. And it shows that uh, indirect comparison suggests that Epixaban and Doxaban were associated with a better safety profile in patients with moderate renal impairment. But as I said before, we do not have data on advanced chronic kidney disease namely patients with creatinine clearance less than 25 or 30 ml per minute. Now, if we look at the estimated drug half-lives and the drug levels based on pharmacokinetics of these drugs in patients with CKD, we notice that as the degree of renal function worsens from stage one to stage four or stage five CKD, the half-life of all these drugs, when given the standard dose, increases very, very significantly. The drug levels undergo a maximum increase in those who are administered Devigatran because 80% of this drug is excreted by the renal root. And in stage four CKD, there can be an increase in the drug levels by as much as 530% with Devigatran. And that is why Devigatran is not recommended in advanced renal failure. We don't have much data with, with creatinine and clearances of less than 15. Epixaban is the least increase in the levels in advanced renal disease up to 36% increase in the drug levels. And when patients are not on hemodialysis, this is the value. If we put the patients on hemodialysis, during hemodialysis, approximately 14% of the drug is removed uh, from the circulation. So the levels are 14% less as compared to those who are not on hemodialysis. There is a significant increase with the doxaban levels and also with rivaroxaban levels, and therefore a standard reduction in the dose is advocated in these. Now, these are the guideline directed uh, doses of uh, various NOACs in patients with renal failure. And uh, those with the EGFR of less than 50, we are supposed to consider individual risk factors, reduce the doses of Devigatran as indicated, uh, reduce rivaroxaban to 15, reduce idoxaban to 30, and Epixaban can be continued at, by the same principle of 5 milligrams two times a day, decreased to 2.5 two times a day on the usual dose reduction criteria. More recently, we have had the approval of uh, the, the FDA and also by the other guideline committees that we can use Epixaban in a standard dose of 5 milligrams two times a day, uh, in, even in patients with dialysis. Uh, provided that the patients do not have the other risk factors which require a reduction of its dose to 2.5 milligram two times a day. But mind you, none of these recommendations in advanced kidney disease is based on any randomized data. Most of these is uh, based on uh, uh, the pharmacokinetic data because randomized control data is very, very sparse. And one such study was renal AF that was presented in 2019, has not yet been published. It was to randomize 760 patients who are undergoing hemodialysis where Epixaban 5 milligram two times a day was to be compared with warfarin with a target INR between two and three. And the primary outcome was the major bleeding outcome, the secondary outcome stroke and systemic embolism. Well, this trial is approximately 27% of the patients received small dose 
about uh, 71% initially received 5 milligrams two times a day, but then later on the dose had to be reduced to two and a half milligrams. So approximately 54% of the patients overall reduced to uh, re uh, received two and a half milligram two times a day, and about 50% received uh, uh, five milligrams two times a day of epixaban. Uh, time in therapeutic range with those who are on warfarin was uh, only 44.3%, and large majority of the patients were sub-therapeutic with INR less than two rather than supra-therapeutic. Patients are more than three times as likely to be sub-therapeutic uh, as compared to being supra-therapeutic, and that has been the experience with most of these real-world data also that has been published with warfarin. Now, coming back to this renal AF, you can notice that there was a very significant incidence of bleeding in both these groups, uh, which was not statistically significantly different, but the number of patients was very, very small, and therefore this study is not very adequately powered. Nevertheless, there, there is a, a, you know, equipoise in terms of its effect on stroke and systemic embolism, as well as mortality. But as I said, the numbers are comparable with both the groups, but the study does not have enough power to give us a statistically significant uh, result. Now we have some real world, real world data available on uh, different NOACs. The largest data available is with that of Apixaban. And here is the Medicare database that was published in circulation in 2018, a retrospective cohort study involving 25,000 patients, which were based on prognostic score matching. 2,350 received Apixaban and the others Wafrin. And all, again, almost 44% received five milligram two times a day. And 56% and received two and a half milligram two times a day of epixaban. And overall results combining both doses of epixaban versus warfarin, you can see there is no significant difference in stroke and systemic embolism. But as far as major bleeding is concerned, there was a significant reduction in major bleeding um, in epixaban group as compared to warfarin group. A dose specific comparison was also made in this uh, particular study. And here is a comparison between 5 milligram and 2.5 milligram doses versus warfarin. 5 milligram is significant reduction in stroke and systemic embolism. Uh, 2.5 milligram two times a day, equivalent to warfarin. Major bleeding was reduced by both doses of epixaban as compared to uh, as compared to warfarin. And deaths was reduced most significantly in the 5 milligrams two times a day dose with a with 2.5 milligrams two times a day dose, which was equivalent to warfarin. There are some other studies that was uh, that uh, we in and overall, if we put all these together, is that the incidence of bleeding with epixaban approximately and twenty. These data and was extremely high. controversial results. And another one, which was in a journal, you can see that the stroke and systemic embolism not very significantly different warfarin. Major bleeding numerically less, not more than warfarin. Again, putting some uh, sort of, uh, and I wanted to speak about the adverse renal outcomes, that means worsening of renal function in patients who get no acts vis a vis warfarin. And here is a uh, meta analysis again that looks at acute kidney injury and all the no acts. Also, the other uh, uh, parameters of uh, kidney dysfunction, like worsening of renal function, doubling of serum creatinine, and occurrence of end stage renal disease. And all no acts overall. Uh, the rate of progression or worsening of renal function is much slower as compared to warfarin, and that is another advantage. So, uh, so in summary, ladies and gentlemen, uh, randomized controlled trial data is very, very limited, but in patients with moderate uh, renal disease, uh, it is available. Epixaban, five milligram two times a day, showed superior efficacy and safety. Uh, and Debigatran, 110 and 150 milligram per day, showed uh, superior safety against warfarin uh, in patients with atrial fibrillation.
systemic review and meta regression analysis with indirect comparisons suggests that apixaban and edoxaban are associated with better safety profile in patients with moderate renal impairment but in patients with severe kidney disease we have very very limited data and knowing that patients with atrial fibrillation are more vulnerable both to breathing as well as to thrombosis individual decision making is very very important but nevertheless we still need uh, anticoagulation i think because whatever available data is it does show that no acts definitely help and uh, they at least produce less bleeding as compared to warfarin and till the time we get more randomized controlled data we'll have to use our judgment uh, whether to use anticoagulation in particular situation or not thank you very much for your kind attention thank you sir thank you so much next hello this is uh, dr sanjay deshpande i'll be talking about device atrial electrograms the utility and value of the same i have no financial conflicts to declare and what we are planning on reviewing during this presentation is number 1 how are equal atrial electrograms acquired how are they displayed and analyzed what is their value in icd therapy and what is device detected atrial tachyarrhythmias and when should we anticoagulate these patients lastly we'll talk about some future possibilities in any device the choice of atrial electrogram depends on one thing and that is first of all does the patient have an atrial pacing or an av synchronous pacing indication if the answer is no then a single lead icd is usually used if the answer is no sometimes a single lead icd with a atrial bipole is used or if the answer is yes a dual chamber icd can be used in a single chamber icd can have two coils the svc coil which is shown here can also give you a far field atrial electrogram because the atrial si signal can be picked up from here otherwise with a single rv lead only the rr intervals are the surrogate for atrial arrhythmias so you can see a scatter plot in the top portion showing you af and a much more concentrated scatter plot below showing you normal sinus rhythm in a dual chamber icd you've got an atrial and a ventricular lead or an atrial bipole in a single chamber lead also will give you an atrial signal and wherever you put it you're going to get a very good signal for the most part how is this information therefore stored now it's stored as ahr episodes or atrial high rate episodes and the time and duration of this is stored ventricular response during the atrial arrhythmia is stored and the percentage of time in atrial fibrillation is also stored the data log looks more or less like this uh in older devices this is the way it, a data log would look the pink dots are the rr intervals showing you irregularity and um, the next thing you'll see is the date of the event mm -hmm. and then the time and duration of the event here's a reprinted report of atrial high rate activity and you're going to see in this very busy chart i want you to focus on one area here that is the atf burden in hours per day how many how much afib or atrial tachycardia was noted in hours per day is charted over time patient activity is charted over time as well and this person looks like they are very sedentary in activity the amount of atrial fibrillation is about 8% longest episode was 28 hours and uh, as you can see the uh, activity level is low in addition you are seeing ventricular rate response during the arrhythmias is also listed as maximum and average 
the start and end times are also listed. The percentage of time in ATAF, as you can see there, has decreased over time since last session. Now that doesn't mean that that was because of specific treatment for AFib, sometimes heart failure treatment or just variation in the AF density can cause the same kind of um, changes. Start times are listed. This pretty much occurs day and night. And a comparison helps in terms of what the AF frequency and severity is. Ventricular rates before and after treatment are also listed here on the right side. You'll see most of the rates are 60 to 80 beats per minute and that indicates a better rate control. In contrast, this is a patient where the ATF burden is much lower. You can see very few episodes and very short episodes of atrial fibrillation are identified and the patient is much more active here. So what is the advantage of having an atrial electrogram in an ICD patient? Number one, you can tell with much better certainty do they have an SVT or a VT when they have an episode? Number two, that can help potentially reduce the risk of an inappropriate shock for SVT. And thirdly, you can monitor for AFib, not just for anticoagulation, but for managing heart failure as well. So here's some examples. This is two panels of electrical recordings. The far field electrogram is like a surface ECG is up here in one episode and down here in another episode. The morphology of that looks the same. It's almost like the surface ECG looks the same. But what will be important is, as you can tell, is that the middle electrogram, which is the AEGM, atrial electrogram, showing fibrillation in the top and showing AV dissociation at the bottom one. So that indicates that that surface ECG, which looks the same, actually can very easily be identified as an AFib episode with rapid rate on top and a VT episode below. Here's another example of a VT episode, V more than A. The A channel is in the middle showing you the dissociation. Here's another panel showing you A more than V, suggesting that this is an atrial tachycardia and in the um, atrial channel and the ventricular rate is irregular in response. And the last panel shows one-to-one -one AV relationship, suggesting this is either sinus tach or an atrial tachycardia. All of these, the atrial channel helps in identifying the mechanism. So using a combination of atrial electrogram and smart tach cardiac discrimination algorithms, we have a very good success rate in sensitivity and specificity to distinguish atrial and ventricular tach cardiac events. Next is atrial high rate detection. Using that bipole in that single chamber lead, you can get performance that is way better than a single chamber regular ICD lead in identifying atrial high rate events. So you can see the blue graph suggests that this is atrial high rate events are picked up much better with the bipole lead than the single chamber lead in the green. In fact, that bipole lead is almost as good as a dual chamber lead system. Well, we should not always believe the atrial high rate events as being all atrial high rates because that's important to distinguish what else could cause it. Atrial noise or even a far field V electrogram in the atrial channel can be counted mistakenly as an atrial arrhythmia. Secondly, atrial blanking might underestimate atrial arrhythmia by, because of undersensing. I'm gonna show you some examples. <clears throat> In the grand scheme of things, 
there are many reasons why atrial high rate events are tagged for a variety listed here. Here's an atrial high rate event in the top channel. The sense amplifier is showing you what looks like a fragmented signal and that's from atrial noise. And it's picked up below um, by the atrial sense markers up here. You can see that is being picked up the noise. In fact, when the noise gets worse, the atrial high rate events are triggering, are, are triggered here and are recorded as an AHR event, even though it was only noise. Under sensing can also occur. Now here's a tachycardia ongoing in the surface ECG lead. And it looks like the markers are saying this is an atrial sense one-to-one -one conduction or actually tracking. Tracking one atrial beat for a ventricular pace beat. But if you look at the electrogram in the atrial channel, you're seeing that there's more than one atrial electrogram. And this one, for example, is being blanked because it is falling in the QRS blanking phase. Lastly, we're moving on to atrial fibrillation detection. There are, besides the AFib that is easily apparent because there are symptoms or 12-ED KG records it, you can find it incidentally or because of implanted devices or monitoring for other causes. And the question is, what is the impact or significance of this? Should all of these be anticoagulated? Because the concern that has been raised is that we know that the, if you have a clinical diagnosis of AFib, then the thromboembolic event risk is higher. That's been established. The question is, device-detected atrial tachyarrhythmias, DDAT, has that association between that and subsequent thromboembolic events been shown or not? Initially, they thought that, well, the shorter episodes, that means that those that terminated within the event or the longer episodes have different prognostic implications. The longer the episode, the more high likely that it's going to cause thromboembolism. But recently, a, uh, a review of 28 studies with a large number of patients has shown that um, there's some subtlety that can be actually derived from here. First of all, DDAT is diagnosed in almost 25% of patients with devices. And it is associated with the risk of thromboembolism compared with clinically diagnosed, very comparable to that of clinically diagnosed AFib. Second, adjudication of DDAT. That means someone looking at that and making sure that that is truly an atrial tachyarrhythmia is associated with an increased rate of true AF and higher risk of thromboembolism compared with non-adjudicated DDAT. And the longer the DDAT episode, the higher the risk of thromboembolism. So if you have a patient that has DDAT on a device and can, you can use it in addition to the chads 2 vas score to refine the individual stroke risk. So if you've got an intermediate chads 2 vas score, your duration might shift your feeling about whether to recommend anticoagulation or not. Here's an example. Here's chads 2 vas score in the top panel, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and greater than five. And the duration on the left panels as no AF, short duration, longer duration. As you can see, the longer the duration and the higher the chas 2 vas score, the higher your risk of systemic or embolism or stroke. What are future possibilities using atrial electrograms and the option what it'll provide for device data and management? So here's a study 
that looked at serial atrial electrograms from remote devices. And uh, what it's showing in this panel on the, on, in panel C, you can get this, this here is the atrial activation rate. And you can see that over time, it goes to pan, the next situation where the atrial activation rate gets faster and then becomes even more disorganized in the lowest panel down here, which is highlighted in pink. What that tells you is that longitudinally, these patients are going from paroxysmal to persistent and permanent atrial fibrillation because of atrial electrical remodeling that is being documented with this event. Machine learning has also been used to predict atrial fibrillation. Now this may have more promise at this point in time, but it has not been realized because currently machine learning to predict AFib occurrence and reoccurrence is limited, but has, up, has a tremendous potential. Today we use clinical risk factors, ECG abnormalities, biomarkers, imaging modalities, and EP data, including device electrograms but that doesn't necessarily mean those are limited to that. In conclusion, the atrial electrogram is an asset and we should use it well. And the diagnosis and prognostic value will be expanded with AI applications. Thank you. Hi, this is uh, Barakandara from New York. Um, um, first of all, I thank uh, HRS for inviting me to uh, speak. Uh, my topic is uh, selecting rhythm control drugs uh, in the session of AF management drugs and beyond. These are my uh, contact details, including Twitter and email account. Uh, um, I have no conflict of interest uh, to declare. Um, my talk, I would uh, touch uh, briefly on cellular EP, role of intermediate drugs in uh, era of ablation, uh, some aspects of guidelines, and what is beyond in drugs for AF management. Uh, uh, in old but useful description of, uh, of uh, um, action potential, um, um, the action potentials are divided into five phases. Uh, the deep polarization phase, phase zero, is due to influx of sodium uh, current. Uh, uh, such that the transmembrane potential becomes rapidly reversed to uh, positive side, followed by uh, different phases uh, of uh, repolarization, mainly due to efflux of different currents and uh, potassium current uh, predominantly. Uh, the depolarization is uh, uh, shown with QRS complex on surface CCG and repolarization by uh, QT interval uh, as such. Um, please note that the sinus and AV node, the pacemaker uh, cells, have a different shapes and different durations of phases. Uh, when it uh, comes to uh, current voltage relationship, uh, um, not all uh, uh, channels display linear relationship. Uh, in fact, most uh, channels display, <coughs> excuse me, what's some rectification. Um, in rectifications, the channels may pass current better over one range of membrane potentials than the another. For example, in this uh, invert uh, rectification channel, as membrane uh, voltage becomes negative, the channel will pass a large amplitude of uh, potassium current. However, at more uh, negative membrane voltage, the current voltage relationship rectifies to pass minimal current. Different endothermic drugs have different levels of channel blocking uh, at different levels. The atrial action potentials uh, also differ compared to ventricular 
the ultra rapid IK current uh, channel like uh, is uh, exclusively representative in uh, in atria. So it makes sense to target this channel with endotelic drugs for treatment of atrial fibrillation and atrial arrhythmias, which would have no effect on the ventricular uh, um, uh, uh, um, myocytes and uh, the proethmic uh, effect of uh, the drug would be minimized or eliminated. Uh, in spite of uh, um, attempt to uh, uh, refine the classification of endotelic drugs, original Oxford classification remains fairly uh, practical and widely used. Um, please note that uh, uh, drugs like amidron uh, is metabolized in uh, the liver, sotolol and dofilite in kidney, but flaconide is uh, metabolized both in liver and kidney. Uh, some metabolites of uh, some parent compounds also display endotelic properties and not necessarily of the same uh, class. One also needs to keep in mind uh, altered pharmacodynamics and kinetics in uh, uh, disease states, particularly heart failure, and uh, that will have effect on the toxic therapeutic ratio in the end. Some um, drugs such as uh, class 1 and 1C particularly show use dependence phenomenon in, in that uh, greater drug effects uh, would be seen at faster heart rate. Uh, hence, the drugs would be more effective in termination of AFib. Um, uh, uh, flaconide, for example, and flaconide will also transform AFib to a total flutter uh, with the one to one conduction uh, with the bizarre QRS complex because of the slow, because of the sodium channel blockade. Uh, Sotilol and uh, uh, dofitilide, on the other hand, display reverse use dependence, meaning um, the drugs have a greater effect at a slower heart rate and hence will be more effective in prevention rather than termination of uh, atrial fibrillation. And also, Dosa de Pont would be more uh, predisposed uh, at a slower heart rate. Uh, we used uh, this, we learned the adverse uh, proemic effect uh, in a wrong way from CAST and SWOT trial, such that flaconide and, um, uh, is actually contraindicated in patients with coronary artery disease. So what's the role of endemic drug in the current era of uh, AF ablation, especially in patients with AF and, <coughs> excuse me, heart failure? Um, in the RACE trial, 245 patients uh, with uh, uh, AF and heart failure were treated uh, with uh, guideline directed uh, therapies for randomized routine versus aggressive option therapy. Um, each patient here is uh, uh, um, sh uh, shown um, in terms of their treatment profile over uh, the study period. Uh, for example, in this patient, uh, following unsuccessful cardioversion trials of drug therapy, catheter ablation, then became. Um, uh, to have more uh, sinus rhythm than AF. The primary endpoint was uh, sinus rhythm on seven day hold to monitor after one year, and secondary maintenance of sinus rhythm and use of enteric drugs. The study results uh, are better shown in the uh, flow diagram. Essentially, after baseline um, electrical cardioversion, uh, about 78 patients uh, percent of patients had AF recurrence, 64. Uh, 56 percent uh, received uh, endotelic drugs, and at one year, 68 persons were in sinus rhythm, uh, 40 percent or so without new AF recurrence. Uh, um, and um, uh, if you uh, look at the captain mark curve, it was the amiodarone, which had uh, better success compared to uh, flaconide and the sotolol uh, combined with dronedarone although Dronodon was uh, used only in three, percent, uh, three patients in terms of uh, maintenance, of sinus, maintenance of sinus rhythm. Uh, furthermore, no difference uh, was observed in AF free survival uh, based on type of heart failure, uh, preserved versus reduced AF and uh, randomization. Hence, almost a quarter of patients with early persistent AF and early moderate uh, heart failure maintain sinus rhythm for at least one year after single electrical cardioversion and endotelic <clears throat> drugs are effective in nearly half of patients, although uh, limited mainly by uh, adverse effects, some non-serious uh, non and reversible. Coming to uh, specific drugs, flaconide, we know uh, is a sodium channel blocker, will have effect on uh, phase zero, but also blocks other channels uh, 
including the inverse uh, sodium current and have effect on uh, repolarization as, as well as uh, um, depolarization um, and will make the um, um, uh, cells refractory um, after repolarization. Uh, flaconide also by blocking sodium current and which will have effect on the electrical remodeling <coughs> um, actually shown to have a, a drug which not only has a robust uh, cardioversion property but also uh, can prevent the AF provided we use wisely. And the risk factors listed here are the one to keep in mind, uh, including uh, Brugada IC sign renal failure uh, when not to use uh, flaconide. In terms of uh, uh, type of 1C flutter, as I alluded before, um, it's a, a one arrhythmia which can be cured by cable tracus with its muscle ablation and then continue flaconide as in this patient of mine who is now um, fib and flutter free for more than five years. So to all, um, multiple drugs have shown efficacy and safety, um, uh, more effective versus placebo and equally effective versus uh, other agents, including imidrone in uh, converting and maintaining sinus rhythm. Dofetilide, most of these studies were done in Europe um, but the drugs was marketed only in the US. The accumulated uh, uh, FDA meta-analysis showed the uh, incidence of TOSAT at 1.7%. So uh, since the drug was not studied uh, in clinical trials uh, and not represented in clinical trials after this uh, um, uh, period, uh, in fact, there is a gap in knowledge in my opinion. But uh, uh, recently, uh, more uh, interest has developed in dofetilide use, uh, uh, partly because drug is now available in generic form. The FDA REM certificate, risk evaluation and mitigation strategy certificate is no longer required. Pharmacies no longer require physicians approval prior to dispensing it. And physicians of course uh, have uh, uh, gained more experience in using the drug. I use it frequently uh, in, um, Retrospective study from here in, uh, from Cleveland Clinic, um, in about 1,400 patients, uh, uh, they found uh, Tosado Point uh, during drug initiations in only 1.2% of patients, although they do uh, uh, um, um, tell that one patient had died. Um, and as expected, uh, female sex uh, patients with marked prolongations and high dose the factors associated with dosage point. Um, this um, study from Michigan recently published uh, where dofetilide and amiodarone were uh, compared. Dofetilide had um, uh, shown similar compared to amiodarone about 65% success rate in maintaining sinus rhythm over one year. And in, um, again, uh, female sex and um, uh, baseline creatine were the predictors of uh, uh, unsuccessful initiation. Uh, in various subgroup analysis, uh, whether elderly or obese patient, uh, the performance was equivalent to that of a neuron. So when it comes to um, guidelines, uh, the ACCHA guidelines are somewhat old, but uh, do mention um, um, use of other drugs before the trial of a neuron. Uh, and of course, the, the newer uh, guideline uh, from ESC um, gives a preference of uh, patient's choice and catheter regulation. But when it comes to um, um, antiadmic drugs, uh, 1C agents uh, indicated for patients with no or minimal uh, structural heart disease, amiodarone for patients with heart failure to reduce EF, uh, coronary artery disease, preserve EF, and significant valvular disease. So to all contraindicated in patients with heart failure to reduce EF, um, but uh, gets class two indications for the other uh, groups of uh, patients. Uh, we in uh, um, US have IV sotalol now, uh, which uh, helps in uh, abbreviating the length of stay. We don't have flaconide or IV uh, vernacalant. Um, we believe that uh, sotalol is a, a fairly um, safe uh, drug, uh, an effective drug, to the point that in a strict COVID-19 lockdown situation, uh, where patients were uh, 
um, desperate for their AF treatment, could not get AF ablations, hospitals were closed. We used a, a novel uh, uh, innovative protocol where patients would come to the office, um, get the medicine, uh, uh, and then we monitor their uh, 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 rhythm through the presence of CIEDs that they had, pacemaker defibrillators and ILRs. By doing 64% uh, uh, of patients after four doses of Sotolol um, uh, were able to restore sinus rhythm and uh, over a follow-up of 46 mean uh, days, 73% um, uh, of patients uh, were able to maintain sinus rhythm without adverse effects. The QT interval and the heart rate, of course, did not change much. Using the same protocol, protocol we were able to initiate Sotolol as an outpatient in patients who had uh, uh, various CIDs, pacemakers, defibrillators, uh, ILRs. And uh, over uh, a follow up period um, um, of uh, uh, um, uh, 23 months uh, or so, um, um, patients uh, were maintained on steady dose of Sotolol without change, uh, much change in QT interval or, or any other issues. Uh, Sotolol, of course, was reduced for different reasons or, uh, or discontinued. So um, in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, um, um, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, anti-admit drugs play a significant role uh, in AF management. Um, efficacy, of course, depends um, uh, on the, the drugs and it's fairly modest. A hybrid approach of pharmacological and non-pharmacological me methods need to be studied systematically. Um, patients needs to be followed continuously. Uh, both safety and efficacy aspects need to be considered uh, when selecting individual uh, drug for individual patients. And based on our experience uh, of uh, patients with AF and uh, CIEDs, we believe that most studies are necessary in evaluating the role of CIEDs for outpatient initiation of antidemic drugs. Uh, with that, I would... Um, um, so, uh, uh, stop mic uh, and then. Uh... Hi. Uh, hi. So th thank you so much. I think it was a fascinating session. We had the whole spectrum of atrial fibrillation from detection to management. And I, I think we have around maybe 20 or just over 20 minutes to have a good discussion. And we'll leave this quite open. Uh, we'll start with a few questions and then we'll try to incorporate everyone's ideas. So, uh, I think the, the first, first, uh, first I talk to Mintu, I'd like to ask you a few questions and then maybe we can have everyone chip in uh, regarding their thoughts as well. So uh, my specific thing is, I, th I, th I think what struck me was that cartoon that you showed actually in between. So my first question I want to ask you is, whether in your trial, did you, how many of the patients actually contacted their physicians after they had a device detection of atrial fibrillation? Was that measured or is that, uh, because I think there may be a lag between the patients actually detecting the atrial fibrillation and actually going to, the, going to their physicians for the recording. Hi, Dr. Subramaniam. Yeah, it's a good question. And I think it is a problem in the US. The, um, in the trial, there was a, clinical protocol so that everybody got a study visit by a, um, a study physician and it was all virtual. So this was happening before COVID. We had telehealth enrolled in the trial. Um, there is a loss of engagement. Not everyone does that. And I think in real life outside of a trial, it's probably an even bigger issue. If you buy a watch and you turn on an algorithm and you get these alerts, you may not understand them. The company is um, that make these do a very good job of educating and onboarding people. But we are right now working with the Food and Drug Administration to better answer the question that you asked, which is what actually happens to people once they receive an alert? How many get health care? How many don't? So uh, that is the next step. Sure. And I think the next question I have is, I think I, um, I think it's for everyone. So I think we have a multiple array of devices now that we can recommend in terms of detection of atrial fibrillation from watches to thing. But I think like you showed, I think the basic difference is one, there's a continuous stream of data and the other one it's episodic. So 
um, everyone's opinion on what they feel. Is it a tailored thing that they choose for a patient or is it a physician preference on which kind of device you actually choose for your patient? Because now the number of monitoring devices seems to be increasing by uh, almost every year that is available to us. Yeah, we don't have any systems in place, right? So the what I mean, the what is the point of monitoring? Part of it is disease surveillance or, or detection, but we don't really have the software capacity right now to manage this. I mean, you really don't need a doctor to look at this if your software is good. Um, other services, other technology, other technology sectors um, manage, you know, 100x more of the information and can do it in an automated way. So at some point we will get there. For now, unfortunately, it falls on us. In the U.S., at least one benefit we have is we get paid for it, so we can set up monitoring systems and have our nurses and practices review the data. I think it's much harder uh, in other areas. Now, I know that people are exploring uh, sort of privatizing this, so I, even in India, there have been models emerging where people try to self-pay for this kind of monitoring, but Self-pay often doesn't work for their patients either because it's not connected to their regular doctor. So many challenges, of course. Yes. Um, uh, I'm Dr. Kapil Kumawat. I'm uh, one of the moderators. Again, um, um, I would like to open this me, question to everybody uh, as to uh, whether a quality of life issue has been addressed with these uh, wearables because they may induce anxiety and uh, um, uh, whether they actually uh, improve the quality of life or whether they worsen it. And many of those who are trigger prone can actually become obsessed with their um, uh, monitoring their heart rhythm. Uh, any any uh, sort of uh, information on that or any ideas on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start briefly, but I'm interested to hear the others, particularly the perspective from India and patients there, which I don't have. Um, we did measure anxiety as a, as a, a pre-specified adverse event in the Apple Heart study, and we actually had all participants measure at the end of the study on a scale what their level of anxiety was, as well as get individual episodes. It's not, um, in that situation, there was some anxiety, but it wasn't that bad. I think there were, you know, a couple dozen people out of 400,000 who reported it, um, in a situation where a consumer is making a choice to do this, they may be more willing and less anxious. In a situation where it's being prescribed to them, they may not know how to handle it, and that could increase the anxiety. I think there's some noise coming from someone's phone. Am I allowed to ask a question? Yes, yes, yes. Please, please, please go ahead. <laughs> I have a question for Mintu. Mintu, Mintu your Apple uh, uh, trial that was published in NGM, there are some very hard, ardent uh, people who really don't follow the Apple technology. And they are more into Android. So I face a lot of patients, you know in New York who are asking me whether Android watches are as good or better. Uh, what is your take on that? Yeah, so so the, the so Fitbit has the same uh, similar technology and had a similar study that was presented at American Heart Association called the Fitbit Heart Study. And their algorithms are, are very good with higher positive predictive values. Um, and that, but that's for AFib identification in an undiseased population. For ECG management and heart rate, they're all thought to be comparable. And so, you know, I, I don't think that, I never prescribe these watches. I never say go out and buy one or go switch from Android to Apple. It's very expensive. At that point, if you really need monitoring, perhaps um, ambulatory patches every couple of months or an insertable cardiac monitor is better. At least in America, they don't have to pay for it directly. Um, so the watches are good. The tech is good. Android is very good uh, products as well. So I would now uh, 
like to ask Dr. Deshpande, you said, sir, that uh, uh, dual chamber ICDs are uh, recommended for patients who have facing indications, but you also highlighted that it's uh, much better to diagnose AF and other atrial tachycardias if you have dual chamber ICD. So would you ever recommend a dual chamber ICD in a patient who does not have facing indication, but whom you believe that may be better served diagnostically if he, if he has got an atrial lead in place. For example, a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patient getting a primary prevention ICD, but having a history of say atrial fibrillation or flutter. So would you recommend uh, dual chamber ICD in uh, this kind of indication? I don't know if that I would recommend it. Uh, I think that it's tempting, but uh, at least based on the current guidelines, uh, ICD dual chambers at least are recommended for with a pacing indication, not with a view towards uh, prognosticating or uh, you know adding uh, information. I think that the atrial bipole lead might be a better option there, it's a single chamber lead. Um, I don't know what the other people feel about this, but uh, I can tell you that uh, at least in our institution, the, uh, we're following uh, policies that indicate that unless you have, you know, what about the patient who already has AFib? And you can say, I want to monitor their burden. You don't even have to wait till they have AFib. So then the, you know, the spillover starts and the indication creep just extends. So, and, and the more leads you add, the more morbidity and risk that you add as well. So I think that you have to have a very strong reason. And at this point, the reason would be pacing indication. What do the other people think? Yes, sir. Yeah, so I think, you know, Sanjay, I do agree with you. And um, a lot depends also, especially to your question, Kapil, about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the age group. And, and, and um, uh, you know, so in young person whom I'm putting a device for even secondary prevention, you know, I would rather not have a lead. Uh, I can still manage the VTVF, you know, that's the par and, and primary goal anyway. But probably older age and other stuff, you know, when happening comorbidities and they're going to get AF already at one ablation. Of course, no, the atrial lead helps. So, uh, yeah, I think it's an individual basis that uh, I would select in terms of uh, whether to go for single or dual chamber ICT. But I have a different kind of, you know, probably if I may uh, interject and uh, uh, shift. Uh, uh, Sanjay, I have a different interest in the atrial electrogram in, in the device patients ICDs, I mean, too, also. And I was looking basically at the over the time frame, any change in the atrial amplitude, we have a huge kind of you no know, uh, data that you can just retrieve, and whether the atrial electrogram decrements uh, over a period of time, uh, does it? What? How does it uh, uh, tell you about uh, the disease uh, substrate, uh, and uh, whether you can actually target your uh, oral anticoagulations. No, of course, impact trial was a totally negative trial in that regard. But what I was surprised, you know, when we did this sub-study and published in JCE, that no matter what, the atrial electrogram attenuates, even in the early stage, you know, of somebody who has only hypertension as the comorbidity. So the atriopathy, the, the new term, the atriopathy sets in very early and maybe there are other limitations because you have an atrial bipole or atrial lead collecting data from the right atrium and, and, the, and the physiologies and pathologies already happening on the left side, left atrium more so. And I think you know, that may become the limitations of the utility of atrial lead, as you pointed out. And if that would be something better if you have something in the left atrium, maybe a CS lead or something else. I, I don't know what you guys think about it, Mintu or Sanjay or Kapna, anybody. Well, the Europeans, uh, the, the, the study that I showed also indicated that the um, atrial electrical remodeling that they measured was with the atrial activation rate. I, I think the new indicated that amplitude was a surrogate in that regard as well for you. 
to show progression in individual patients. And you, you're right. I, I think that these are crude measures at best, I, I, as I see them, and they have to be used uh, collectively, which is where, um, rather than individually, uh, because I, I don't know that signal collection on the right side necessarily reflects uh, true process uh, and whether that by itself is responsible for AF. What do you think, Mintu? Sorry, audio cut out. Could you repeat that one, one more time? I said, uh, I don't know whether the, you know, the, any of these can be individually used. Um, and uh, I think that we are using the fairly crude measures uh, to try and prognosticate and uh, predict occurrence or recurrence of AF. Yeah, so it's a good question. So I think th there's a few companies working on this and a few groups working on this. One is, um, can your sinus ECG today, if you've never had AFib, predict your risk of AFib tomorrow? And, and Paul Friedman and the Mayo Group have done a nice job with that. So they have taken, they've taken all the features we've known, which is P wave area under the curve, um, V1 um, left atrial abnormality, PR interval, et cetera. Um, but instead, they just put it all in a deep neural network and used AI. And they published this in Lancet. And there is, uh, it is pretty good at identifying a group at a high risk of having new AFib. So that's one. The other is, this sort of continuous or semi-continuous monitoring in the same patient, whether it's an ICM um, or a watch uh, PPG irregularity, where it can detect PACs first, or, or simply heart rate, um, to look at near-term episodes of AFib or even Holter. And that's a little harder because you need time series data. And the other problem is do you, you know, we talk about anxiety. Well, if you had a prediction model that said you have a 30% chance of getting AFib in the next three days, that's going to cause a lot of stress. And it may not be actionable because you would need another trial to show that you could actually alter that trajectory by treating it with an antiarrhythmic or something else. So I think there's lots happening. There's also, a, you know, the new therapies of inhaled uh, antiarrhythmics, uh, class 1C drugs, which are in phase 2 and soon will be in phase 3 trials, which are attempting to treat um, paroxysmal AFib like asthma. So you just take a nebulized uh, version of flecainide, and it's like a pill-in-the-pocket approach uh, that can convert you right away. And so obviously for technologies like that, you would need that to be linked to a home-based ECG, either a watch or something else. Great. Um, I think we'll just, uh, I'll ask, I wanted to ask Dr. Uh, Sethi. Excuse me. Uh, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, yeah. May I request uh, Dr. Sethi, sir, to join the GBM? Yeah. Right. You may audible now? Yes, sir. Sir, uh, sir is it possible want you to, to join, join the yeah, GBM, sir? sir? General body meeting. Oh, what time is the meeting? Uh, it's just starting, sir. Okay. You, you would have got the uh, link on the mail. I'll just I have a look at it because actually I'm traveling somewhere. I'll just have a look at it and then I can try to join it. Sure, I can do that. So Thank you. So let me excuse myself out of this session then. Sure. Sure. Thank, Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So then maybe I'll uh, continue with the discussion on the AF detected by the devices. So this is a question for Dr. Deshpande and Dr. Turake, especially, and maybe others can chip in. So what do you think is more important? Is it the duration of individual AF episode or it is the total burden of AF? I know it is a pretty cliched question, but and there may not be any specific answer to it, but what in your opinion would be the most important factor in terms of risk of thromboembolism, whether it is the duration of individual episode or the total AF burden detected by these devices? Dr. Deshpande, you begin with this. Thing, if you can. I don't know that I have a clear answer, but I would put all the factors together uh, in the sense that you, know, you have to look at the chas 2 vast which is the known risk group, at least, and then view the duration, view the uh, episode 
um, look at other uh, confounding, uh, sorry, other uh, comorbidities, and um, I, I, and make a decision on in on an individual basis. I don't know that there is uh, a prescribed algorithm that that we follow, but I think we sort of put things together on our own. Perhaps we need more. Um, we need. Uh, uh, better way of doing this with uh, with machine learning uh, rather than uh, rather than individually doing this you know they have a device then you know looking at the electrogram data and you know combining all these things together probably will make a better decision rather than picking one isolated factor alone I agree with Dr. Deshpande. I, Chad's VASC is horrible. I, I have another talk that I give um, that um, talks about that score. It is based on very old data and a biased sample and only had one year of follow-up, which many people don't um, realize. So all of these decisions we're making on lifetime anticoagulation are based on one year of follow-up from a small group of patients in Europe who were seen in a cardiologist's office or discharged from the hospital at a time when warfarin was already commonly used, but for whatever reason, they were not on anticoagulation. So I think in 2021, that kind of approach for risk stratification would not generally uh, pass muster. And I think what we do need are new strategies. I think in the process of having bad discrimination and identifying who will have stroke and who won't. We've erred on the side of treating almost everybody. And to some extent that's been okay because the direct oral anticoagulants are safer than warfarin. But I think if you look at the real world event rates, uh, post-market in data sets, the stroke rates are very, very low. Um, they're, they're, they're really low and much lower than even in the pivotal trials. So we're actually treating people that are probably healthier. Some new, uh, I think a new risk score, whether it's AI or something else would be good. The problem is we can't find a population that's untreated anymore because everybody's on anticoagulation. So who do you study and in what data set do you get? So we have to go back to clinical trial data and see what we can make um, or do trials again. There is one trial in the US that is likely to happen where low CHADS VAS patients with paroxysmal AFib that is low in burden will have their anticoagulation stopped during periods of prolonged rhythm, and they will use watches or other things to, um, to ensure their daily ECG. So, you know, 20 years from now, we're not going to be treating it like this, but it's hard to know how we'll, where we will be. Um, I thank all the speakers. We are short of time now. And uh, we had a very engaging session on non-ablative aspects of atrial fibrillation. Uh, we also realize now that the more data we have, uh, the less we know about atrial fibrillation. And uh, thank you all the speakers, especially from the US who logged in at a very awkward time. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we'll uh, close this session now. Thanks again. Thank you. 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 Thank you.